believe the right thing. But do you know a lot of the times believers believe the right thing out of context of what the Scripture actually teaches? And the whole counsel of God is in the Word of God, and there are places in the Bible that talk about different things. And you ought to know where it's at in your Bible. You ought to know what the Word of God says. And not just so that you can have an answer to give to every man, but that, that is important, but so that you can be sure you know what you know. Because anyone can construct a speech or a sermon. Sometimes it seems that the more eloquent preachers have messages, but those messages aren't preaching the Word of God. That's their message. And a lot of times they preach truth, but sometimes when I hear those messages, I go away saying, why don't they just preach what the Word of God says? They said, everything they said was true, and they did a good job presenting it, but there was no authority behind it because it's what they said, not what God said. So that's what we want when we look at the Word of God. And I trust that as we've studied Revelation this time around, that it has strengthened your faith, encouraged you, and ultimately caused you to understand how to live in light of the things that we learn. So I want to look at some concluding final remarks as John is sharing this experience that he had with literally seeing heaven open, seeing angels of the Lord, showing him things that were once mysteries, which had now been revealed, and now he's concluding the things that had been taught. Now, let's read our text this evening, and then I actually uh, would like to just do a little review, and we'll have a short message this evening. In chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 7. And, and then that's where we'll uh, stop reading our text and we'll deal with several other verses. This is speaking of the angel, and the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 22, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, <laughs> clear as crystal, proceeding out, of the mount, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees, tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Father, as we really conclude where we began, I pray that our response would be to keep our eyes lifted up, looking for Jesus, who is the author of our and finisher of our faith. God, who has literally done everything necessary in order for us to have redemption, in order for us to have the things that pertain to life and godliness, and who awaits nothing which must be done in order for us to be able to expect His soon coming. Bless our hearts this evening with understanding. Help us to have a worshipful mindset as we approach the Scripture this evening. And then ultimately, God, help us to have our eyes open to see simple truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is that description that goes beyond where we were at last week when we saw a description of the new heaven, the new earth, and then the literally New Jerusalem come down and on earth. Uh, Lee asked a question the other uh, evening after service. It was a good question. He said, is heaven, is it square? Is it a cube? And, uh, you know, that's a pretty fair question. We know that it's about 1,501 miles high, 1,501 miles wide, and the length and the breadth and the height of it. But the question is, could it be dome-shaped? You know, and sit on it, the question is, how would it look on the earth? We know that literally 1,500 miles high 
is very, very high. Uh, a very, very high, what's the highest mountain? Is it 1,800 uh, or 18,000? Is it 18,000? 28,000. Okay, I don't even know that, the answer to that. Uh, I know 9,000 is pretty high, and then like 11 to 14,000 is really high. So, who said, would you say 28,000 feet? Is that Everest? What is it, Ruth? Really? 28,000. Round, Roundish, 28,000 feet. Okay, so that's feet, right? Okay, so that's like five miles high, five and a half, almost six that's miles. 29,000 and 29 feet. What is it? 29,000 29 feet. The highest mountain is? Mm -hmm. So just shy of six miles high. Heaven, the highest point in heaven is 1,500 miles. The New Jerusalem, I meant to say, yes. We were, we were talking about the correct terms last week. The New Jerusalem is is 1,500 miles high. That will be down on the earth. That will be the predominant feature on the new earth. For certain. <laughs> uh, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. If Christ is in heaven preparing mansions for us, if he is in his Father's house preparing mansions, and if the temple of God, which is where the Father lives is what's going to be on this earth. It's going to be some structure. So is it cube-shaped? Uh, I don't have any idea about that, actually, but it's 1,500 miles high. Whereas today, the highest mountain would be shy of six miles high. And so the comparison for me is uh, it's pretty, pretty stark in contrast. Pretty stark in contrast. So anyway, that's just... As food for thought, fun thought. The predominant feature on earth will be the New Jerusalem where God dwells. The predominant feature of the New Jerusalem will be God and the throne of God where God is. And as spectacular as heaven is, quote, the New Jerusalem is, it's really like a diamond in its setting. And I know that that really pales in comparison. But the Lamb, the throne of God and the Lamb, that is the feature of heaven. And I shouldn't say that. He is the feature of heaven. We're going to have full access and a place there. A mansion there. It's pretty neat. Pretty thrilling. All this has been explained to John. The end of the heaven and the earth, final judgment, God's justice, and God's plan has been explained to John. And now we see some final remarks that restate what has already been stated as well as help John to put in perspective all the things. If, that, if these are true, this is what you do with them. So that's what we'll look at this evening. Let's just conclude with the things uh, that, that he's told to do. First of all, in verse 6, these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his, now I love the plural here, unto his servants the things which must, what's that next word? Shortly be done. The trend today, and it is a trend, I know uh, the people that embrace it try to say it isn't. The trend today is to deny that the next event on God's calendar is for Christ to take His saints and for God to begin judgment on this earth. But that is the next thing that's, that is on God's calendar. The next thing that's coming is that the Lord Jesus is going to come and to call up His saints. The question is, when will this happen? I come shortly. I come shortly. So when is Jesus coming? That's the question. When will Jesus come? Very soon. And John is told, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let's run back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 really quickly and just look at the parallel to that. Really, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We could also go to Matthew chapter 24. But we'll go to 1 Thessalonians for now.
verse chapter 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now let me explain something very simple to you this evening, but it's something that I think is often passed over. Matter of fact, this came up in our service Thursday night in Miami Beach. Somebody was asking questions about this, and I thought, you know what, I think a lot of people don't put two and two together here. What were the events that happened the moment that Christ had finished the work of the cross, that is, dying for sin? What were some events that happened simultaneous with Christ's completed work of the cross? The veil was rent from two from the top to okay, the bottom. There are two events. That's one of them. The veil was rent in twain. The saints, were the saints came out of the graves and went into the city of Jerusalem. Now think from the perspective of first century saints who certainly were eyewitnesses of the accounts uh, that are told by the gospel accounts can you imagine could you imagine that being a fraud story could you imagine matthew writing the saints wrote luke writing the saints rose from their graves and went to the city of jerusalem and they were seen by people can you imagine writing that story just making that up can you imagine how much credibility the gospels would have with anybody can you imagine writing the temple veil was rent in twain? Would there be anybody that would be familiar with whether or not that story was true? Certainly, those were indisputable events that happened the moment Christ finished the work of redemption. Where did the saints come from? Well, they were in paradise. They were in the grave. Okay, now follow the logic and the thought. Here you are, and you're a believer, and your spouse is a believer, and your spouse dies after you've seen everyone that slept in Jesus resurrected. If you were to go to a grave in Jerusalem, you would only find those individuals that were not believers in the grave. You realize this? Somebody's talking the other day about Rachel's grave. Rachel's not in the grave. Somebody's talking about Sarah's grave. Sarah's not in the grave. I'm telling you, they're gone. And it's an, it's an indisputable fact. And so now your spouse dies... And you're like, they believed in Jesus, didn't they? But their body's still there. And so you say, well, isn't, the, isn't there a resurrection? The Sadducees, oh, there's no resurrection. It's a one-time event. Jesus, you know, the saints just came out. Do you, you see the question that the believers would have here? And if Thessalonica, they're really in turmoil. Were they really believers? Was the promise really, you know, Peter said, the promise is unto you and unto your fathers and to them that are afar off. Is that really true? Well, of course it's really true. The Word of God says so, but what about these people that you could literally still find their body in the grave? What about them? That's the question they had at Thessalonica. Does that make sense to everybody? So Paul said, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep is, is, just means dead. They died. I mean, if they're a believer, they're not dead to God. So they're sleeping. And so he said that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Now, if you saw your, your, your spouse's body or your loved one's body and they, and they were a believer in Jesus and they were in the grave, well, that would be tragic, wouldn't it? Think, well, they're supposed to go to heaven if they, you know, none of us are supposed to die. Jesus said he was going to come quickly. The next event on God's calendar is Jesus coming. What's wrong? What's broken? This is what Paul is answering the question to. So he said in verse 15 or 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now, is he addressing people who believed in the death and the resurrection? Yes. Yes. They believed in the death and resurrection. He said, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now the word will, is that past, present, or future? It's future. So now the saints that Jesus brought from paradise, Abraham's bosom, they were already resurrected, but the saints that were sleeping, I can imagine, I'm going to tell you something. Doctrinally, if I'm from Thessalonica and I've got a concern, this is one of those... Whew, because... Their promise, God's going to bring those saints with Him as well. In other words, that, the resurrection of their physical bodies, is a future event. 
for the saints previous to the cross, the resurrection was now of their bodies was now a past event. Or it happened. And so they're told, no, this is a future event. This is something that will happen. And then it goes on to say, uh, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now that's interesting vernacular, isn't it? The word by the word of the Lord. What is that phrasing signifying? Okay, God said, and who was it that used that kind of a phrase? What, what people use those kind of phrases? Prophets. Prophets. Prophets, right? Thus saith the Lord. This is a thus saith the Lord statement. So literally, Paul understands this letter he is penning to Thessalonica is the Word of God. A strong statement. I ought to give you a little chill bumps. If you realize, you know what? The authors of the Scripture knew... They were writing, you know, a lot of believers just think, oh, they just, they didn't know. I mean, it just turned out so good. You know, they wrote a letter and it ended up being Scripture. No. Paul said, this is God's Word. Thus saith the Lord. So, he said, uh, this we say unto you by the Word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And prevents a fine, fine word there. It simply means... Uh, to take precedence over or to go before. So we're not going to go up and then they're going to go up. Actually, they're going to be resurrected. Uh, the Bible says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then what's that word then? Is, what, what tense is that? Then. Well, yeah, it means after this. The word then is when this has happened, then this. So when is the bodily resurrection of the saints who died after the cross? What's well, a future event? When are we going to go up with them who are alive and remain? After they do. And uh, the question is, oh, by the way, let me answer one more question or just address one more thing. Somebody... Uh, mentioned after service, Brother Matt, I think it was, that said after the service Sunday evening, he said, you know, he went to a class on religion. It was in secondary university. And they, I'm trying to remember what how he phrased it, but they used as an inconsistency in the scripture, you know, the rapture. Because if Christ comes and takes up his saints, uh, if everybody's on opposite ends of the world and we're all looking up to Jesus, it's an impossible thing. The Bible doesn't indicate the manner of Christ coming as being instant. Uh, the Bible says, remember when Jesus ascended to heaven and the angel said, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which he saw ascend into heaven, shall so come in like manner as he saw him. And what did Jesus do? Did he go, and gone? While they watched, he went up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. So, Jesus is, I'm sure he'll do it more swiftly than we're accustomed to. But it isn't a... Everybody goes up at the same time. Lord Jesus is going to come take us up and go around the earth. He's, he's got it managed. He's got it handled. He's, he is uh, certainly more capable than we. I do think he'll maybe do a little sky clearing. If you think about it, I, I'm just envision, I have visions of the rapture, how I think it's going to happen. I've been practicing my flips and my spins and my told you so movements and all the Superman moves uh, for when I go up. But I imagine that we'll have a pretty good line of sight. If you think about the New Jerusalem and the Lamb being the one from whom the light of the throne flows out of, we can see the sun, right? Shouldn't, but you can. Can you see the sun? How far away is the sun? How many thousands of miles? I think it's 90 million. What? 90 million. 90 million miles? 93 million. All I'm saying is when Jesus calls us up, He just needs to clear some clouds. They'll be bright enough. And His glory will outshine the sun. And when He calls us up, it's, it, it can happen from a pretty great distance. Get it? Everybody understand where I'm coming from there? So when people try to get technical, oh, yeah, it's not possible. Yes, it is possible. It's actually very, very possible. You just have a small God. That's all. He's not small. Yes. Um, 
the phrase twinkling of an eye. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the manner of his coming. Elaborate on that. Um, that that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, suddenness. It doesn't have to do with speed. It has to do with, yes, when we go to chapter 5, that's what you see in 1 Thessalonians. In other words, right now. But somebody could walk in this door right now. They don't have to come racing in. It could be, I'm almost there. You know, the idea of it is instantaneous, but it's not talking about the motion. Okay. It's just how soon Christ will come in a moment. Right? But the description of how he comes uh, is the twinkling of an eye. I mean, I'm sorry, he is, he is as he ascended, right, right. as he went up. Right. And you look at any other ascension. We only have a couple other examples of ascensions, right? We have uh, Elijah, and uh, I, I, did anyone, yeah. no one witnessed Enoch. He was, he got, he sneaked off and got <laughs> taken. Okay, so let's, let's, let's uh, go ahead and cover this now. Verse 18, we're to find comfort in these words. And then we see that with regard to, there is a difference between Christ bringing His saints and the second coming of Jesus. Every description of the second coming has Jesus coming here. When we're called up, when we meet the Lord in the air, that is not the second coming of Jesus. Does everybody comprehend that? If we meet the Lord in the air, He's not coming here uh, to be with us. If we go and meet the Lord in the air, we're going to Him. Do you see the difference in the description there? Now, this is not, this is not uh, what's the word I like to use? Rocket surgery? You don't have to be a rocket surgeon <laughs> to understand this. In other words, I love, I love that. <laughs> came up with that one myself, folks. You don't have to be a rocket. No, I didn't actually. Who came up with so, Anyway, I like it. Uh, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to understand the events that are simply laid out here. If we meet the Lord in the air, is He coming here? Or is He calling us up? That's not the, this is not the second coming which is described here. But the second coming is described in verse 5. But at the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's a second event. The day of the Lord is very, very clearly laid out and explained. It's called in other places day of Christ, day of judgment. And that's when Jesus comes to do business. And that's when He comes to straighten out this earth, to judge the wicked. And the day of the Lord, the Bible says, so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay, now, a thief comes how? Unexpected. Quietly, unexpectedly, secretly. And it goes on to say, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. And then verse 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, so the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, is something that will begin when Jesus calls us up. That's when He's going to begin the events that precede His coming. And all through Revelation, we see those events. After we see the church taken out in chapter 4, there's never reference to the church again. And then you see the judgments, and then ultimately you see Jesus finish those judgments by coming. That's the second coming. And we know when that's going to happen, and we're not in dark. That day's not going to get us by surprise. You know, the little rapture pranks are fun, aren't they? But the reality of it is, is that no believer in Jesus is going to be surprised at the second coming. That's what the Bible says. You're not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Isn't that good news? And we're to find comfort in that as well. Because let's go back to Revelation chapter 22. I know we could go to... Uh, Matthew chapter 24, and I'm not going to this evening, but if you did have questions about the order of events there, uh, because there are so many people that deny that the next event is for Christ to call up His saints, uh, they deny that the rapture is the next event. What do they say the next event is? Uh, for Jesus to come down and begin working in His kingdom. It depends. There's all different positions on it. You can't really pigeonhole it to one thing. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is describing events that are future events, uh, the disciples ask Jesus a question. But you have to understand the question. 
When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answers, though there are three questions asked there, and there are three questions answered there. What happens is believers make them one event. It isn't one event. The disciples asked three events. Jesus began the answer by saying, uh, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. And then he goes on to describe the way that his coming is going to be. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that that coming is, we're not going to be surprised by it. It's not going to overtake us as a thief, and yet we see it described as overtaking those that are there as a thief. Why? Because the judgment, my friend, is never for the righteous. The judgment is for the wicked, for the unbeliever. They're the ones that are going to suddenly be overtaken. And I'll be honest with you, it's frustrating how that believers will do so much work stringing together different passages of the Scripture to explain events in their timeline, but they won't spend the time just to look at grammar and the events as they're literally described. Friend, you don't have to be confused about God's timeline. It's not confusing at all. If you will take the Word of God literally, with the exception of the places where the Word of God allegorizes, of course, believers allegorize God's Word. When the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven is like, or this will be like, that's an allegory. It's a description. This is like this. It means it's not exactly this. This is like this. But when the Bible says this is, then it is. Growing up, I remember seeing <laughs> cheesy animations <laughs> of, uh, you know, like Jack Van Impey and so forth, coming up with, you know, just looking at the calendar, looking at the wars and rumors of wars, and literally predicting, well, you know, the end is, is near. Jesus said there's always wars and rumors of wars. Always are. They unsaved people and Christians alike, when they find out I'm a pastor or a theologian, they say, what do you make of? And whatever the current headline is that day, what do you think this means? Tell them, Jesus is coming soon. That's what they want you to hear. You know, oh, it's got to be like, this means, my friend, Jesus' next event has always been that He's coming quickly. You're back in Revelation 22, right? Look at verse... 7, Behold, I come quickly. That's always been the situation since Jesus began His works. It's the Holy Spirit came and is led Him. Okay, so now, the first thing, we're going to see three things this evening. That's the first thing. Jesus is coming quickly. And so, what does that mean? The second part of verse 7, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Why do we study Revelation? Well, in the beginning, the first chapter, we saw there's a blessing for people that study the prophecy of the Revelation of the book. Why do we study Revelation? Because there's a blessing in it. So, what we do is we apply the truths that we've seen. We live out, literally, the reality that God is going to judge the wicked. When we realize that God's going to judge the wicked, we have a two-fold response, don't we? The first thing is that we make sure we're not the wicked. Right? The second thing we do is we warn the wicked. That's how we keep the prophecy of this book. Make sure we're not the wicked and warn the wicked. Now, you could elaborate, couldn't you? I could go point A, B, C, D, E, F, G under each of those, but it's pretty simple. Secondly, second thing that John has told uh, that I want to look at this evening is that he's told in verse 10 not to seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. I don't mean to be mean, I don't mean to be unkind, but I will be blunt and direct. I have very little patience for someone who thinks that God complicates or hides truth from believers. If many of the individuals who claim to be experts in Bible prophecy are correct about their theories, the things that they believe with regard to end times events, 
they're the only ones that could possibly have known those things because they're the only ones that figured it out, right? I don't have much patience for people that make too much out of things like hidden messages in the Bible. Unlocking the hidden messages of the Bible. There are a lot of people that I think mean well. I'm all for significance of numbers. Fine. You tell me number seven is significant. Good. Tell me the number six is significant. Good. Number three is significant. Good. Those aren't really Bible doctrines. And if they are, only mathematicians could find them. What's the middle word of the Bible? Well, it depends on which translation you use, what language. Right? I mean, honestly. I hear people, oh, this is the middle word in the Bible, and if you multiply it times 40,000 and divide it by 20,000, and then you look at this word, and you take this word, and you put this word together, and you have the two words, the end. <laughs> Yeah, I'm being a little bit over uh, dramatic about it, but I mean seriously. You can play all kinds of silly games. No one is going to just read the Word of God and come up with that. Can I help you something? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If there's no private interpretation, my friend, God didn't give you some truth and withhold it from me. And God didn't give me some truth and withhold it from you. Uh, pardon me, but that's Catholicism. That's any cult spinoff of taking spiritual truth or spiritual things and trying to withhold them from people so that you can conquer the people. That's Nicolaitan. Right. Seal not the words of this prophecy. Don't put a seal on it. This is for everybody. I don't know about you, but that thrills my heart. To know that God gave His Word to me. Now you may think, well, Pastor, you know, <laughs> you've been to school, you've studied the Bible. You know, perhaps more than the average guy. Let's tell you something. You can know God's Word with absolute certainty and confidence as much as I can, and I can know it as much as you can because it's God's book revealed. God wants you to know His Word. He wants you to have confidence. He wants you to have security. He wants you to know how to live. And don't you love that? John is told. And was, John, was John a little bit special? The disciple whom Jesus loved? He got to be there on the Holy Mount of Transfiguration. Three guys in the world got to see Moses and Elijah come down Got to see Jesus in the fullness of His glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's amazing. Was John a little bit special? Yes, he was. Does it make sense then that he got to see the Son of Man on His throne in heaven and, got, and he had this special religious experience, if you will? It's not a religious, it's an actual experience. Does it make sense that he had that? I don't begrudge him of it. Makes sense to me. Aren't you glad God said you can have it too? There are some things in the Revelation that God said, seal it up. Don't write this. Don't write it. We can't handle that. But I'm telling you, everything that's in the Revelation here is for us. Seal not the words, or seal not the book, verse 10. For the time is at hand. So when is it profitable for us to study and live out and practice Revelation? See, this book, my friend, this, this portion of the Scripture is not written so you and I can spend all kinds of time talking about what God's going to do next. This book is written so you and I can spend our time living the truth of this book. It's made, made to live. Not to talk about. Not to surmise about. I'll tell you something. Most Christians who are into prophecy are hobbyists. They're just playing. They're playing with concepts. But it doesn't mean anything with regard to the proximity of the coming of the Lord Jesus and how we ought to live in light of it. We don't want to be in that category, do we? We want to be the ones that are blessed because of it. There's more the Scripture has to say. The last thing I want to look at is in verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Well, that's, that's a quite an invitation, isn't it? 
and let him that heareth say, Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. In other words, on the basis of what the Word of God says in Revelation 22, the practical application of all these events that are taking place in the future is come. God wants us to believe. God wants us to escape judgment. That's the message for today. We see, of course, the warning, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's a serious matter. Those, did you read about the plagues in the book? We did, didn't we? They're bad. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I could spend a lot of time on that verse. Friend, it is important. It is important to understand preservation. It's important for us to understand that we don't tamper with this book and we don't allow tampering with this book. It's vitally important. And then again we see the same message. He that testifieth of these things, things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And then the prayer that you and I ought to pray every day, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we recognize that you're going to come soon. And we say, even so, just like you said it, come. Amen. You're dismissed.